Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the eight-game main slate that we have here on uh, Monday, July 24. It's been a while since I've been able to get something up, had some audio problems and, you know, weekend shenanigans, all that kind of jazz, but we're back here for a nice little eight-gamer. Um, interesting tournament slate we have here on a Monday. Um, some kind of fishy pitching that we've got here in the early going. A uh, couple of spots that are naturally going to pop out at us, right? Luis Castillo gets the Twins. Um, here in the early ownership runs, we're seeing this number kind of creep upward a little bit. Started at about 20%. It's, you know, it should be north of 30 uh, and that's kind of where we're seeing it drift. You Darvish, obviously, seeing a, a lot of ownership here against Pittsburgh, which kind of makes sense. We'll get into that when we get to the games. Um, down here in the mid-range, Logan Allen gets Kansas City. I think this kind of makes sense as well. Talk about that a little bit more. Kenta Maeda also seeing ownership against Seattle, who strikes out a crap load. Uh, everybody down here in the lower half of the pricing spectrum, not really thrilling to be playing a lot of these guys, right? Um, we'll get into all of these guys as we, uh, you know, go over the game. So, um, brief sort of first look overview, kind of gut feeling, uh, construction wise, we're going to probably want to just get to a couple of these guys that just project well today. Um, it's pretty difficult. I mean, certainly in, in tournaments, you can take some shots, right? You could take some shots on a guy down here, like a Graham Ashcraft or, or something. That might be a little bit surprising or kind of gulpy here with a Patrick Corbin. Uh, he gets the Rockies. Um, you could take some shots, but for the most part, you don't want want anything to do with a an Adam Wainwright, Michael Grove, Quinn Priester types. Uh, Jake Burr's just going to open for the Rockies. Can't really do anything there. So... For the most part, um, you know, we might want to stay to the upper end of the pricing spectrum here where guys are projecting pretty well and we've got a little bit more confidence. That should tilt us onto uh, some pretty, I, I suppose, chalky builds. Uh, so we're still going to have to figure out how to get different. I think there's a couple of teams here you could consider doing that with and certainly um, plenty of players that we can mix in. We don't need to get different with everybody on our teams, just a, a spot or two, you know, here or there. So that said, um, that's kind of the, uh, you know, initial reaction for me here. We've got projections and, and ownership loaded as well, uh, but keep an eye out because naturally they, they do change. You see this ownership standard deviations for both Castillo and you Darvish select or suggesting rather that uh, we've got some noise yet to flesh out here. Um, these are pretty big figures here, so let's uh, let's just get into the games and kind of see if we can go over them briefly here. I'm trying to keep it a little bit shorter here today since uh, I am kind of running a bit behind here this morning. Uh, we don't have to talk all that much about Jake Bird. Um, he's just going to open for the Rockies. It's likely to be Carl Kaufman. I don't have him in the sheet here because we've got some maybe a little bit of confusion around the industry. Um you know, we do have some guys projecting Kaufman, but a lot of places just take the MLB list, and MLB has Jake Bird listed. So uh, we're just going to leave him in the sheet here for now. Kaufman is very much attackable. A you know really young right-hander has just kind of had to come up, not really ready for the big leagues, but uh, Colorado deal dealing with so many issues in the rotation that they didn't really have a choice. So they're likely to continue with these bullpen game shenanigans. Um... And that's why we see Jake Bird here. He's got a very, very high ground ball rate. This arsenal could actually play for him if he were able to develop, uh, you know, a fourth pitch, like a, a good swing and miss pitch against the opposite side of the plate. He does have the curveball, right? Um, but he's going to have to really sort of develop everything out here. A lot of this is kind of noisy, right? 28% K rate uh, is nice to lefties, right? Um, and that's mostly coming from the curveball, but at Coors Field, obviously this is in Washington, but uh, for the Rockies, you know, you need to develop uh, something that's not a curveball, right? You have to have a slider. The, the two-seamer cutter is really strong, but you've also, usually the, the most equitable sort of repertoire is a two-seamer cutter slider change, staying totally off of the curveball. 
uh, at altitude. You know, that said, he does induce some whiffs, and he induces a hell of a lot of ground balls. So that's going to be difficult for Washington, even though he's only going to go an inning or two here. It's going to be difficult to get too excited about Washington. They had so many ground balls. A lot of these guys are going to hit it mostly on the ground. There's only a couple like a Jamer, Kbert against righties. Uh, will hit it in the air a little bit, maybe a Dom Smith. Everybody else, though, hits a boatload of ground balls. Um, now, Carl Kaufman's ground ball rate, not nearly as high as Jake Bird's here, so that could play into the Washington strengths a little bit more um, from a batted ball perspective. Price-wise for the Nats here today, they're still cheap, as they really have been all season, and you can definitely play them because you know Colorado's going to run out of bullpen game, and... You know, for the most part, it's okay to be going after what's likely to be a young, inexperienced uh, arm coming in for them. Even though they may miss out on their first AB, you know, the first or the top third, top half of the lineup, give or take, against Jake Bird. Um, you know, we don't want to be stacking against Jake Bird necessarily with a guy or with a bunch of guys that hit a lot of ground balls. Um so they may lose out on a little bit of value there, which kind of takes me off of the Nationals. I just don't like playing offenses in bullpen games uh, for the most part. You can still play some of them, so I'd probably prefer short stacks of the better hitters, uh, like a Jamer. C.J. Abrams you can play at 3,600. That's fine because um, they're likely to see. They don't have many lefties coming out of the bullpen with uh, Brent Suter hurt over here for the Rockies. So it's mostly right-handers, um, and so their lefties are, are going to play okay. Like C.J. Abrams, Jamer, Kbert, and Adam Smith, like I mentioned. Dickerson is okay against one of his old teams. Um, that's fine, but he hits a lot of ground balls. Not a lot of power anymore from Dickerson as well. But So you can get to some of the Nationals, but a full eight-game slate still kind of difficult to get too thrilled about playing them, even in a kind of attackable spot when they just get to Colorado Rockies. Uh, Patty Corbin uh, is going for Washington. 7,300. I think he's kind of in play. Um, what really makes me balk a little bit here with Corbin. It's not necessarily the batted ball stuff uh, this season. He's still getting ground balls as well. The hard contact rate is hovering at 34% against the right side. Been a big problem for Patty in the past, of course. We talked about this several times this season. He's really gotten a lot of the hard contact woes under control. Still giving up batting average, of course. Let's not get it confused here. He's still only striking out 16% of guys in aggregate and pitching to an 81% contact rate. So he's not going to blow it past people. And he's still getting, you know, giving up some average here and giving up a little bit of production, 360 Woba. That's a pretty big number. 175 ISO, still a pretty big number. He's not going to walk anybody. And he's for the most part staying off the barrel and keeping the baseball down in the strike zone. He does have the line drive rate. So that's how he's attackable here. If I had to choose full stacks it's got to be Colorado, as a matter of fact. Um, even though I do think Patty is kind of in play, it's the price tag for him at 7300 here that is taking me off. That's a seasonal price high. And even though Colorado got absolutely destroyed by Jesus Luzardo yesterday, uh, well, Patty Corbin has half of the strikeout rate that Luzardo has. Um, so if, if we do want to go after a little bit of Patty Corbin, and he's seen 15% ownership here so far, I think that's okay because the Rockies still hit some line drives. Notably, Jerry Profar from the right side of the plate is far, far better as a right-handed hitter than he is a lefty. Um, Chris Bryant, we'll have to keep an eye on him. Hits the baseball in the air a little bit. Still makes good, solid contact, even though with the injuries, they've kind of totally der derailed his career. CJ Crone, have to keep an eye on him because his back has been acting up a little bit recently. Zeke Tovar is probably the favorite if either one of Bro, um, Bryant or Crone are out tonight then you'll likely see Zeke Tovar back up but you know in the two hole or something like that um, Elias Diaz has one extra base hit in all of the month of July so he's been really struggling after a very good first half and Elias Diaz just kind of you know regressing back to normal Elias Diaz numbers that said he's still 4300 and a you know, a five-hole catcher piece that you can get to in stacks if you want to go after Patty Corbin a little bit. Um, Jerry Profar up at the top, I would like to mix him in in stacks. As I mentioned, you know, he's actually got pretty damn good numbers against lefties this season, not so much against the left side. If you want to throw in a Ryan McMahon to get really contrarian with it, uh, his problem is strikeouts. 
right? And Patty Corbin's really not going to strike him out necessarily. We need McMahon to be able to get the baseball in the air. Unfortunately, he still hits some ground balls, and Patty's going to be able to induce some of those. So not my favorite there either. Would likely like to focus on on right-handers, probably some short stacks just because, you know, Colorado's generally pretty bad. But I think they're very much in play. I'd prefer full stacks of them to the Nationals if I had to choose between the two. Um, but I think the Rockies, they're a little bit more attractive to me here than Patty Corbin, even though I do think he is kind of in play as well. Uh, 7300 I just don't like a seasonal price tag high on him. Um, so that kind of takes me off a little bit. I think some of these Rockies from the right side are in play. Certainly a Randall Grichik. He's got fantastic numbers against righties or against lefties this season. So that's kind of how I'd like to play it. Um, no pitching from the Rockies, of course. Maybe a little bit of Patty Corbin in some deeper tournament stuff. Um, not super thrilled about getting to this in like a 20 max, to be honest. I'd rather play the Rockies there. But deep tournament stuff, pretty much everybody is in play, I think. Okay, let's move on to Kansas City and Cleveland. Ryan Yarbrough on the mound for the Royals. Logan Allen for the Guardians, 5800 for Yarbrough here is kind of an interesting price tag. Um, they're stretching him out, right? And his last three starts gone five and two thirds, six and five and two thirds, and he's pretty respectable. He's always been a, um, you know, a pretty good arm when he came out of the bullpen with Tampa, for example. But they got rid of him just because he doesn't have a hell of a lot of upside, and Tampa really likes to, likes to play numbers. Um, and unfortunately for Ryan Yarbrough, he just has to throw up by some more people. You need swing and miss stuff in this day and age in baseball. You have to be able to, um, you know, to induce swing and miss and induce strikeouts. And Yarbrough just can't do that. What he does do very well is induce with the four seamer cutter slider change arsenal here. He induces some a, a good bit of soft contact to opposite handed hitters. And that's always what's kept him very serviceable and really why Tampa hung on to him so long. Um, 248 batting average allowed this season in 100 hitters. we got a you know small sample here, but this is mostly who Yar Ryan Yarbrough has been his entire career. Been a bit of a reverse splitsy type of guy uh, with a break-even four-seamer. Really bad changeup. Uh, so he's not getting a lot of swing and miss, of course, to the righties. But he gets all of the bad changeup value right back with that really good cutter value against the right side. And here's that soft contact rate against the right. He's 23%, just 31% hard contact to the right side. We'll give up some fly balls, but we're pretty much okay with that when the soft contact rate is so high with such a low or average hard contact rate. So we're not terribly worried about this even though he doesn't have a, a lot of swing and miss. So um, he gets Cleveland over here. So from an upside perspective, it's certainly not there for Yarbrough, of course, right? And Cleveland popping a little bit in um, in value score so far from an offensive perspective. Do I really want to go out of my way? Not necessarily because for the most part, I mean, Josie Ramirez, got he's got absolutely dreadful numbers um, from the right side of the plate this year. I don't want to be playing him at 5,700, to be quite honest, even though he is the best hitter on the team. I'd probably rather play a, a couple of these lefties over here. It doesn't quite display in this short sample the numbers uh, for Yarbrough against lefties this year, but historically has been a reverse blitzy type of guy due to that really good cutter. Um, break-even slider, break-even fastball, break-even change that he will throw to same-handed hitters here a little bit. So that kind of puts some lefties in play for me, like a Stephen Kwan, Josh Naylor. You can play some Josh Bell. He's going to pop, even though he is going to hit for the right side against Yarbrough. You can play him a little bit. He's 3,000. Um, David Fries, in a very short sample this season, has got pretty killer numbers against lefties. I don't really want to play a lot of the right-handers necessarily, so probably just short stacks like a Stephen Kwan, probably staying off of Andres Jimenez because his numbers against lefties are terrible, and he makes a crap load of soft contact. Not interested really in that. So I'm kind of off of Cleveland here a little bit, and I think their ownership is possibly going to steam because they're still cheap and still very attainable price-wise. They're going to make a lot of stacks happen for you. I'm kind of off of them a little bit, but uh, I'm okay playing some. I almost always, uh, like, fading full Cleveland stacks on, well, pretty much any slate, outside of, like, five gamers or less or something, um, just because they don't have any power, and they hit a lot of ground balls down here, right? Buck 38 ISO, 125 ground ball to fly ball with no hard contact. 
So it's really hard to get there with them. Even though they do create a little bit at an 88 WRC plus and don't strike out, they're still just not all that impressive. So if I had to choose, it'd probably be with Yarbrough, but I don't want to do that because his there's just no upside here for him at this price. I'd need him a little bit cheaper, I think. So probably just going to stay off of it mostly and get to some one-offs from Cleveland. Logan Allen going for them. 8700 for him. I like this a, a decent bit here. Um, now, the, ch the, the change-up is good. Um, the cutter here is really leaving it on the, on the table. And that's really how some of the Royals uh, from the right side of the plate are going to be able to uh, attack Logan Allen here. But he's got an okay fastball, uh, well above average change, given that the fastball is about break-even relative to league average, and a break-even slider. Um, this is a plus matchup because the Royals, I mean, at this rate, they might win 40 games this season. They are so bad. They do have a lot of right-handers, however, and they're going to be able to hit for a little bit more average, maybe not so much in the power, but he'll still be able to induce some swing and miss, and that's with the four-seamer and the changeup. Even though the cutter, relative to league average, is pretty bad, he's still got it in the arsenal, and he can still throw it to induce a ground ball here or there, and that's where we see the buck 50 ground ball to fly ball ratio come into play against the righties. Does have a 36% hard contact with a 263 batting average allowed to the right side. But once again, it's not going to be so much in power. It's just a little bit of average. So I think uh, Logan Allen here at 8,700 is very much in play. There's another guy in the same price range we'll get to probably in the next game, I think. Um, if you want to pivot, that's fine as well. We'll talk about that. But at 30% ownership, I think this kind of makes sense. Not a lot of uh, you know arms we're really excited about today. And I think Logan Allen just kind of has to be one of them sort of by default. Everything in plate discipline-wise is, is pretty good here, even though he's lacking a little bit in the raw CSW. The strike one rate's good, walk rate's good, chase rate is fine, north of 30%. Swinging strikes at 12% are fine. We'd like some more called strikes out of him, yeah, but he doesn't barrel, or get barreled, rather. And he induces a good bit of, uh, you know, medium and weak type of contact with just an average 89-mile-an-hour exit velo. So overall... Um, the only way I think that Allen really gets picked apart here is with some strand rate regression, right? Got a three and a quarter ERA with expected metrics pointing a little bit higher than that. So as I mentioned, they could hit for a little bit of average. That's Mikhail Garcia, Bobby Witt, Salvi Perez, as I mentioned, he's got terrible numbers, uh, against lefty. Actually, I didn't mention him. Um, that was Josie who I mentioned, but Salvi also has terrible numbers against lefties this season. 4,600, rather play other catchers. Matt Duffy's Still hitting 300 against lefties. He's very cheap in the middle of the lineup. You want to play some right-handed pieces here and get some leverage off of Logan Allen. I don't think this is horrible necessarily, but um, probably not going to go out of my way to do it. I'd mostly just prefer playing a good bit of Logan Allen here. Uh, okay, let's move on to... Oh, we are kind of frozen in the sheet here. There we go. Uh, to Seattle and Minnesota. Luis Castillo, these are... I, I think we're probably going to want to get to mostly pitching in this game Castillo going for the Mariners, and Kenta Maeda, he's the other guy I was talking about in that same 86, 8700 price range. For the Twins, 10-6 for Castillo. I just hate playing him above 10,000, man. Um, and it's because of this changeup. I don't trust that he throws so much of the two-seamer still so far. And the changeup value, we talked about this in his last several starts, is declining at a quite precipitous rate here. Um, he's just getting absolutely blasted with it. He comes in the, at that three-quarters release point, and it's flat. And he does the same thing with the slider, so that's a little bit of the hard contact that he gives up to the right side. And he does throw some same-handed change. That's hard con contributing to the hard contact as well to the righties. And the bad change of value, floating it right over the middle of the plate, is contributing to the power to the left side, right? 221 ISO allowed. He's got an 080 ground ball to fly ball here with a 33% hard, giving up a full two homers per nine. So if we want to go after Luis Castillo, it's mostly going to be with lefties, but you could mix in a righty or two in a full stack if you choose to do so. That'd be like a Byron Buxton if he's even in the lineup. Who the hell knows? Uh, he just stinks. He's still priced over 5,000, and he's hitting sub 200. Um He's got like a 750 OPS or something. He's just awful. He'd be the only righty that you could consider if he's in the lineup. Um, perhaps a Kyle Farmer doesn't strike out all that much. Or 
maybe one of the catcher pieces as just like a short uh, little three-man punt stack or something. Don't really want Michael A. Taylor down at the bottom of the lineup. He's in the nine hole. It's a bad matchup, and he's got historically much better numbers against lefties. Correa, of course, from the right side, he's, since he's leading off and he's Carlos Correa, still didn't strike out a lot, even though the power numbers have really dropped off a cliff this year. He'd be definitely the one if I had to choose uh, any righty in the lineup to include. But Eddie Julian, he's their sec starting second baseman now. Um, when Georgie Polanco comes back, they're going to give him reps at third base. So Eddie Julian's not going anywhere. Similar to like a... Uh, you know, Alex Kirilov, now that he's back and healthy and getting more ABs, he's their starting first baseman. He's not going to go anywhere. Uh, Max Kepler looks to be healthy, uh, at least. And he's going to be in there against right-handers, right right in the middle of the lineup. So, Matt Walner, they've been mixing in, having him DH or even play in the outfield because Busk, Buxton is just a, a total shell of him, of his old self. Um We'll see what they want to do with the lineup. They got a lot of lefties over here, man, and that makes me nervous at an expensive price tag. Now, I know price tags are relative to everybody else on the slate, and 10-6 is still certainly very much playable on an eight-game slate. He's one of the highest upside arms that we have going uh, in terms of raw strikeout stuff. He has seven innings and 10 Ks in him at pretty much any matchup. But this is a dangerous one because he's got a very bad and a very vulnerable pitch here. Well, two of them that he will throw to opposite-handed hitters. And as we mentioned, that contributes to the 1.9 homers per nine of the lefties into 221 ISO. So he is attackable with a couple of these cheap twins pieces like Julian Kirilov, Max Kepler in the middle. Matt Walner still just 2,200. So if you want to run a full stack, uh, go ahead. Include Correa or maybe a catcher, maybe a Kyle Farmer, something like that, with three of the lefties. If you want to run four lefties, I'm okay with that as well. With a Julian Kirilov, Kepler, Walner, and then throw in Correa, something like that. Seems fine, and that's probably the way I would like to attack with the Twins if I'm trying to get leverage with Luis Castillo. That said, he's certainly in play because he's still got a 28% strikeout rate, and the Twins are terrible, right? They still strike out at a 28%, 27% clip themselves create a little bit because they hit for some power and get the baseball in the air. So that's how they can get there and how Luis Castillo at an expensive price tag could get blasted here um, or just underperform. And if you want to get a little cheaper, get to some more expensive stacks, fading Luis Castillo might be the way to do that. So on the other side for Kenta Maeda, 8,600, I'd like to play him too, even though his ownership's starting to pump a little bit. He was far less popular in the early going this morning. But this makes sense to me also because Seattle is also bad, right? Neutral and 101 WRC plus here, 26% K rate for them, 227, 227 batting average, that is, with a 165 ISO, 33% hard. They hit it on a line and get it in the air at the same rate as the Twins, right? But strikeouts are a big problem, as is batting average for both of these teams here. So um, it's really just leverage stacks and short stacks that I'd want to be targeting here. Um, so five-man stacks are certainly in play due to the high probability that these guys are going to be very popular. Um, but for the most part, I think you just have to side with pitching. My favorites from the Twins over here would be, uh, you know, those lefties, as, as we talked about, and from the Mariners. Um, I don't really want to go after Kenta Maeda, but it would be a couple of these cheap right-handers like a Gino, Tay Oscar, Julio's 4,900, not necessarily cheap for him, but maybe starting to heat up a little bit. These guys are going to strike out a lot, and I think that's why we have to mostly just side with pitching here. Okay, let's move on to uh, Texas and Houston. Um, John Gray, 8,700. Now, this is a very interesting spot here, a very interesting tournament spot, and I think the market's kind of agreeing here, and I see the same sort of stuff. It's his slider that's going to help him really succeed here. Um, now, the changeup, he might have to use this same-handed change, which is generally not a very good idea, unless the changeup is fantastic. It's a really good change, but it's mostly against he throws it mostly against left-handed hitters. He might have to use that here tonight because, well, Houston only has right-handers uh, outside of Kyle Tucker. Um, still missing Jordan and never going to get you know, Michael Brantley back, unfortunately, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they're still exceptionally right-handed heavy. And the slider here is what's going to make it 
play for John Gray. I don't like this price tag on him at 87. In his last several starts, I've mentioned that we'd want him cheaper and cheaper down in the low 8K range, especially in bad matchups if we're going to consider playing him. But due to the arsenal here, even though his four-seamer's bad, right, Houston's going to be able to tee off on that with a, a pretty good probability. He does have a really, really strong slider, and he's going to throw this a lot. So against right-handed hitters at Houston, actually, against um, you know sliders this season, has struggled pretty significantly. They are giving up, uh, let's see, about a quarter, th- you know, a third of an out um, above average to the field. So I guess that would be a third of an out below average, um, you know, on a slider. And John Gray's slider is very, very strong. So what we're really concerned with, of course, is just raw upside. Not going to be able to strike out a ton of guys, even though the slider is good. It's mostly a ground ball type of slider for him anymore. Not necessarily a swing and miss type of slider, right? Sitting at just a 11.5% swing strike rate, 15% called strikes with a 27% CSW. That's all fine. It's just that swing and miss is leaving it on the table for us. His big issue, though, has been this season with left-handers, 177 ISO, 1.6 homers per nine. So it's not to the righties. I think that has to put him in play here a little bit. Once again, don't like the price tag at 87, but it makes him a very intriguing sort of 20 max and deep tournament type of play. And I think that the market here, this could be, you know, maybe just due to the lack of options. Um, you know, we do have Kenta Maeda and Logan Allen in this exact same price range. If you want to pivot off of both of those guys and get to a little bit of John Gray, if you're playing a very um, popular stack like a Toronto who will get to or something like that, I think that's very much in play, probably staying off it in like three max and single entry or something. But I think the slider can play here tonight. Um, and you could see a, a relatively decent outing from John Gray. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, this 8700 price tag in a admittedly down strikeout matchup, two ticks below average here is, uh, you know, notable and kind of concerning. Brandon Belak on the mound for the Strohs here, 7800. There is absolutely zero chance I land on Brandon Belak tonight. Um, I'm going to totally X him from the pool. Now, let's not get carried away with the Belak. He's had a couple of good starts, right? Two of which came against Colorado. Um, one came against Minnesota, who we just talked about, and another came against Oakland. Everything else has been, um, you know, average to say the least. So I want nothing to do with him, even with, you know, without uh, Corey Seager uh, for Texas, who is on the DL now with a sprained thumb, I believe. Uh, 7,800 is just a total non-starter. Everybody in the lineup over here for Texas still, even without Corey Seager, still has Wobas north of 320 against right-handed pitching this season. They hit the baseball on a line. They're all incredibly dangerous. Um, and I don't want to deal with any of that with Belak here because he gives up pop to both sides of the plate, 190 ISO to the lefties, 198 to the righties with a 200 X ISO. He's actually running a bit hot, right? 271 XBA with a 358 X Woba and an 18% strikeout rate. Aggregate 36% hard contact rate. He'll be able to induce some ground balls, which is nice. But as I mentioned, Texas hits the baseball in the air. And a lot of these guys over here that you want to play, like a Marcus Semien, fly ball hitter. Addy Garcia, fly ball hitter. Jonah Heim, fly ball hitter. Josh Young, fly ball hitter, etc., etc. Uh, Nate Lowe, not so much. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball from the left side, at least. But he's still a damn good hitter himself. So this is a pretty bad matchup for Belock over here. 52.5% strike one, 9.5% walk rate, and an 11% barrel rate. So there's zero chance I go anywhere near Belock tonight. Uh, I think Texas has got to be one of the top stacks of the day, and they may be my favorite. I think we probably just have to default to Toronto and Arizona, who we will get to. But I really like Texas, and their ownership is going to be down because they're missing Corey Seager and Marcus Semien and Addy Garcia are still pretty expensive. But everybody else is going to make a stack very much playable, and I like them a lot here tonight uh, going after Belak. I think he's due to get blasted. Uh, he is not n- anywhere near as good as the two outings against Colorado and the outing against uh, Minnesota, or outings, I should say, against Minnesota and Oakland have suggested. So 
Uh, it's really all of the other outings in between where he has cracked 10 DK points uh, twice this season. So let's, uh, in, in a full 12 starts outside of those, what, four. So let's go after Belak here. I don't want anything to do with him and play a lot of Texas. Do I want to play some Houston? Uh, probably not. I mean, you always play Kyle Tucker. He's 6,200 now. Um, we might actually get Jordan back tonight. Uh, I, th I believe they talked about activating him uh, for this series here. They thought about doing it over the weekend. It may have just been pushed back to Monday. So if they do get him back tonight, that takes me off John Gray, obviously, uh, a little bit more. And, and Jordan's 5,900. Yeah, you can always play him, even though he's coming off the DL. We don't really care. He's Jordan Alvarez. He's top five hitter in baseball. So um, that would take me off if he is indeed back. If he's out still, I think you can play John Gray. Even if Jordan's there, maybe, maybe, maybe he's his 20 max play still. But that would shove me into more um, you know, mass entry type of stuff with John Gray. Certainly at an 11% ownership that... Starts to seem a little bit fishy high if Jordan is back. Uh, that's just how good Jordan Alvarez is. He totally changes the entire complexion of this lineup over here for the Astros. Um, so at an elevated price tag and slightly elevated ownership for John Gray, that would take me off. Um, so you just have to keep an eye on that. But for the most part, it's just Texas here for me and one-offs with a Jordan or Kyle Tucker from the other side. I don't really want to play anybody else because they're all right-handed and they stink. Uh, okay, let's move on. Cincinnati and Milwaukee. Graham Ashcraft, I think he's got to be in play here today. And this is really why. Well, number one, Brewers are terrible. Uh, they're one of the few teams in baseball that against pretty much every pitch they see are a net negative relative to league average. Um, they do hit the changeup at a slightly above break-even rate. Um, well, unfortunately for them, Graham Ashcraft doesn't throw a change. So against every other pitch, they're giving up outs relative to the rest of the leagues. And we can evaluate um, you know, pitch values for offenses the exact same way that we can evaluate them for pitchers. Now, Graham Ashcraft's stuff is not impressive. We talked about this several times this season. He's only got three pitches, two of which you do not want to be throwing um, in most scenarios, right? A cutter to same-handed hitters and a two-seamer to opposite-handed hitters. You do not want to be doing this. However, the sinker, since he only had two pitches coming into the season, he has started to develop this a little bit, and he's throwing it a lot over his last six, eight starts. Um, this is continuing to tick up in the overall usage here. It's, this was, you know, 3 4% in the early going this season. And, well, and his last several starts, he's throwing it north of 20% of the time. Right? So he's using it a lot. Not getting a lot of value, of course, because it's still a two-seamer. It's still a bad pitch. Um, that said... This is still Milwaukee, and they're still a bad offense, right? 88 WRC plus is the same as Washington over here. Buck 45 ISO, 32% hard contact with some ground balls, and a 24% strikeout rate. Now, Graham Ashcraft not going to strike out a lot of guys, of course. He's going to walk some with a 9% walk rate. It's not horrible, but it's starting to creep up into notable territory. Has trouble throwing strike one. If he were a bit more efficient early in the count, it would allow him to, you know, work a little bit better with the cutter slider um, and the two-seamer, you know, to a certain extent. Of course, he's not impressive. He does have the velocity, but he needs a little bit more. He's got to stop throwing two bad pitches uh, in, you know, to their, uh, the other side of the platoon, I should say. Um, you know, with the cutter to righties and the, and the two-seamer to lefty, You just can't do it because they're bad pitches, and that materializes in the power that he gives up still, 175 ISO, 180 ISO, two lefties and righties respectively. However, the X ISO hovering down here at a 150. So I think we're looking for a little bit of positive regression here for Graham Ashcraft, and with a very significant fundamental change in the repertoire here that he's throwing the two-seamer a hell of a lot more, Milwaukee still only has a couple of lefties, Um We'll have to keep an eye on uh, Rowdy Telez. I believe he's still hurt. They may activate him sometime soon. I'm not sure if he's got to go out on a rehab. Probably uh, first. But they've only got, what, three lefties, maybe four, having brought Sal Freelich back up. 
uh, or up for the first time, I should say, with Yelich Winker, who is terrible. Uh, he's may as well, you know, they may as well just hit with eight guys. Um, and Bryce Terang down at the bottom of the lineup. That's it from the left side of the plate. So they're not really going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the two seamer because they don't have all that many guys. And the cutter is actually still pretty respectable against the left side of the plate because he does induce a full 20% soft contact with just a 21% hard contact rate. Against the right side is where the two seamer is really going to shine a little bit more. So he's going to be able to induce a hell of a lot of ground balls here because even despite. Um, you know, just having two pitches for the majority of this workload here, uh, this sample size, I should say, he's still inducing a lot of ground balls. And that's really attractive. He doesn't get barreled here, even though he'll give up some line drives. So do we want to get to the Brewers? I don't know. I think I'd rather play Ashcraft. I'm not super jacked about the price tag, but like I said, with a very significant fundamental change here in the arsenal, uh, I think this 6,800 has kind of has to be in play at super low ownership here. Nobody's going to be playing him today because he doesn't have any upside usually. Uh, but I think he can survive here. He'll pop every now and again, and I think this could be one of the spots where he does so. Uh, Colin Ray on the other side for the Brewers. I'm likely to stay off of this, I think, a little bit, and I'd probably like to get to some of the Reds. Now, they're still very expensive with Ellie at 59, McLean at 57, um, the other guys are getting a little bit cheaper. Friedel at 43. Jake Fraley, I really like at 46 today. Uh, Johnny India, his price tag continuing to drift downward, finally. Uh, he's at 4,500. Joey Votto at 47. That's a fine price tag as well for him. I'd like to get to some of these guys. If you need to get cheaper, play somebody down in the bottom third, like a, a CES. Um, Tyler Stevenson from behind the plate. He's still 4,000. That's not great. Or Will Benson, who has been pretty respectable. He's just 3,000. I think this is okay. Colin Ray's got a really, really good fastball mix, but a pretty terrible secondary arsenal. It's very similar to, like, a Mitch Keller or something. Keller throws his change, whereas Colin Ray's, you know, jacking around with his split. Um, but bad slider, bad curveball, bad off-speed pitch, whatever it is, really, really good fastball arsenal here. Well, unfortunately for him, the Reds are a fantastic fastball-hitting team. And with Ellie up at the top, TJ Friedel and Jake Fraley with Joey Votto, notably all from the left side here, I think this is a pretty dangerous spot for Colin Ray because he's still maining a two-seamer, even though he does have the cutter. He's not inducing any soft contact or ground balls with it. So he needs to be throwing this to left-handed hitters to get the baseball down, which he cannot do. 34% hard contact, 2.1 homers per nine, and a 242 ISO to the left side of the plate this season for Colin Ray. So I'd like to get to some of the lefties over here, uh, lefties in particular. If you want to mix in a Matt McClain, well, I mean, he's 5,700. Nobody's going to be playing him because he's 5,700, but he has fantastic numbers this season. Really, really high upside hit tool for this kid. And you can always play Johnny India as well at second base if you land on that. Uh, I think this is fine. Reds are very, very stackable here. You play correlated stacks with Graham Ashcraft too if you want. So I think that's kind of how I'm going to approach it, try and get a little contrarian with it here today. They're not going to pop the Reds in value. That's because they're so expensive. But I think it's a pretty decent fundamental spot. Um, and I'm probably going to stay off of most of the Brewers here. I don't like the price tags for them over there. Uh, South Freelick, sure, if you want to play a left-handed piece at 3,000 flat. Um, but I generally try and prefer to play righties against Ashcraft because he throws his cutters so much to this same-handed hitters. That'd be like a Willie Adamas or a Willie Contreras, but I don't really want to jack around with that. Um, so overall, kind of unimpressed with uh, Milwaukee, pretty much top to bottom, and I'm kind of on the Reds here uh, a decent bit. They're only pick them in the betting markets right now. I think that's a pretty decent play, to be quite honest. All right, let's move on. St. Louis and Arizona. Adam Wainwright is back Have, after uh, whatever it is, you know, a couple weeks stint on the DL. Um, you know, it was it that he was totally hurt. I mean, I don't know. I want to, I don't want to throw around all kind of accusations like that, but um, <laughs> he has been uh, poor to say the least. Every single one of his pitches is giving up a hell of a lot of value. He doesn't have a single thing to go to work with this season. Now he's claiming that he's fully healthy. It's the best he's felt in two years. I don't care. Um, might he have a good start? 
just, you know, healthy and refreshed coming off the DL against a super dangerous lineup over here in Arizona? Yeah, maybe. At 6,000, would that put him in play? I, I guess. I mean, I'm not doing it, so you guys go ahead. 12% barrel rate nearly, 53% strike one with a 23% CSW. No chase, no swing and miss. There's hard contact to everywhere. I mean, he's been better against righties, um, you know, in a hard contact arena, but he's given all of that back against lefties. 36% there with a 327 ISO. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, these numbers are absolutely dreadful dreadful for Wainwright, so I'm not going anywhere near this tonight against Arizona. Um, that's why I mentioned Arizona's kind of got to be a top stack. The three guys in the middle, Cattell Marte, Corbin Carroll, and Christian Walker, still expensive, but they're very much playable in, the, in this matchup. Uh, Wainwright's just been too, too bad. Uh, I think you just got to go after him and continue to go after him. Um, if he starts to turn things around and puts together a string of very good starts then maybe we can consider it. But uh, I'm not in the business of, um, you know, taking super punts on guys with numbers this bad. So no thank you against a really, really dangerous offense. I've talked about this pretty much all season with them. I do not like going after Arizona, especially with average and below average right-handers. Um, give me as much Arizona as I can get. And if they're off the board in ownership, they probably won't be. They're going to be like the number two, I think, Um to Toronto today, so that's, you know, I mean, you're going to have to balance ownership, as you naturally would, but uh, I don't really care. Uh, I would like to go after uh, a good bit of Wainwright, and if he makes me look like a jackass, then uh, so be it, I suppose. Ryan Nelson on the mound for the D-backs, 6,700. Um, I'm probably going to have to leave him on the shelf, too, and I really don't like the, well, of course I don't like the upside, right? Swing and miss here at 16% strikeout rate is not impressive. Just an 8.5% swing strike rate. Not a lot of chase either at 27%. 23% CSW here for Ryan Nelson as well as Wainwright. I mean, there should be a hell of a lot of contact tonight. Um, so I don't understand why anybody would consider playing really either of these guys, to be quite honest. Both of these offenses are incredibly dangerous and still very good. Uh, I'm frozen in the sheet here. Here we go. Um, the Cardinals, buck 12 WRC plus, 21% strikeout rate, still making a lot of hard contact and hitting for power. Goldschmidt got a day off yesterday. He's back in Arizona. And at 6,100, it's, it's pretty stiff. Arenado got a price bump. 5800 for him. Lars got a price bump, who actually came out of the game yesterday, uh, hurt his heel. He might not even be in there tonight, so we have to keep an eye on what they want to do with the lineup. Um, Nolan Gorman should likely be back in there. Not sure why he didn't even start yesterday, uh, but they're playing the Brendan Donovan second base shenanigans, or I don't know what the hell Ollie Marvel's doing over here, but... That said, I still want to stack the Cardinals if I can because Ryan Nelson's going to pitch to 83% contact himself. 87% for Wainwright. There should be uh, batted balls all over the place tonight. Um, I don't want to deal with any of the 6,700 Ryan Nelson. I think he'd have to be far, far cheaper for me to consider this and take out or price in some of the risk that you're taking when you um, go after the Cardinals. It's still a very good offense, even though the team overall is still 12 games under 500. It's the pitching staff, as we've talked about ad nauseum this year, for the Cardinals that has led them astray. So um, no pitching here in this game for me. I want to get to as much offense as possible. And if both Arizona and St. Louis are off the board in value and ownership because they're kind of expensive, then that makes them attractive tournament stacks, I think. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Um, okay, let's move on. Pittsburgh, San Diego. And Quinn Priester on the mound getting his second start in his first start against Cleveland. It was not good. Uh, he gave up seven earned in, whatever, five and five and a third, something like that. Yeah, so at seven earned in five and a third, walked just two guys, which is encouraging for him because in his upper minor starts over the last couple of months, uh, he'd been struggling with the control a little bit. So that's nice to see. Uh, the problem is he just throw it, threw it right over the middle of the damn plate, and Cleveland just teed off on him. So um, do I want to take shots on Quinn Priester here again tonight? He's, well, he's a sinker baller, and he doesn't have a swing and miss pitch. So no, uh, to put it succinctly. He was very efficient early in the count, throwing strike one. That's very attractive. But going against uh, it, it, 
going after a still a, a very dangerous offense over here in San Diego. I don't really want to do this with a super young arm. I'm not totally sure he's ready either for the big leagues. Uh, he's a high upside prospect for them. But once again, he is not going to be a swing and miss guy. He's going to project for about an 18 to a 20% strikeout rate in the big leagues because it's a two-seamer slider type. He does have the change, can induce some soft contact and roll over ground balls with that um, that repertoire. And he'll throw a little bit of the curveball a little bit as well. So uh, might be able to induce some swing and miss there, but I'm going to play the wait and see game with Priester here, and I'm not, I'm not going to go after the Padres. Um, I would like to probably get to some Padre stacks if I can make that happen, but they're also expensive. Tati 64, Soto 55, Manny and Bogarts at 52 and 48 respectively. Uh, Hassan Kim's been leading off finally uh, for the good majority of the last, I don't know, three weeks, maybe two weeks. He's at 4,200, dual eligible in the middle infield. Go ahead. You can certainly play him in stacks. Um, they're not super left-handed heavy, which is really what I'd like. So I do like Jake Cronenworth and, of course, uh, Juan Soto here today. 5,500 Soto, I think, is a really good play. Same thing with Cronenworth, though. Unfortunately, sole first base. Not a ton of power upside, but he's still a really good hitter. Kind of struggling to find it a little bit so far this year. This is a good spot for him because he's going to see a lot of a two-seamer tonight. So, um... I got no problem getting to San Diego, but due to their price tags, it's keeping their ownership down. So let's do it. Similar to Cincinnati and Arizona and St. Louis. Uh, if that's the case, I would like to go after them. Uh, unfortunately, to get to all of these expensive offenses, you're going to have to punt somewhere on the mound. Well, and that's really why I'm kind of on Graham Ashcraft a little bit. So um, that's going to be hard construction-wise to get to all of the expensive hitters, but that's kind of how I would like to approach really contrarian constructions today if we can make it happen. Um, unfortunately, we, we really want to play you Darvish, too. He's 9,400, and he gets Pittsburgh. He throws 46 pitches, and I, I think Pittsburgh is, is likely to be able to, or likely to struggle, I guess I should say, um, against this type of arsenal. Now, they, they're a pretty good fastball hitting team, uh, four seamers in particular, and Darvish is four-seam fastball is not very good, but he doesn't have to, since he's got so many pitches here in the RC, he's got six others that he can work with, and really Pittsburgh, that's the best uh, value that they bring to the table. They are below average uh, in every other pitch. I, I suppose they have shown some pretty good numbers against the curveball in particular this season, but Darvish's curveball is fantastic, right? So that's going to be a really tough matchup for them, and they're going to be unlikely to eke out a lot of value because they don't hit the sinker, cutter, splitter, any of a changeup or a slider all that well. It's just the four-seamer and curveball where they get value, but as I mentioned, Darvish, he's just got way too much here. Uh, against right-handers, he'll give up some pop, right? 35% hard contact, some ground balls, at buck 30, so it's not terribly worrisome, but it'll give up a little bit of power, 175 ISO and one and a half homers per nine when he gets onto the barrel a little bit. If you want to play some leverage pieces here, it'd be of just Jack Sawinski and like a Henry Davis, um, maybe an Andrew McCutcheon or something at a 4,300. Not super jacked about that. Um, probably going to stay off of Brian Reynolds from the left side. Just hasn't shown a hell of a lot of power since he got hurt. And after the first month of the season or whatever, um, you know, the, the numbers have really kind of dropped off, and he's still 4,700. So I don't really want to go after Darvish. I would like to play as much Darvish as I can, but it might be a little difficult given how much I like the expensive offenses. So that's what we're going to have to balance here. I've got no problem getting to most of him. This is the best spot of the day, I think, um, from a fundamental perspective. But if you want to play, you know, DFS theory and whatnot and leverage some pirates against him or just outright fade Darvish and get elsewhere, you know, that's a fine construction too. But... Uh, mostly just the Padres here, and it kind of makes sense that uh, you got to lay $2.60 on them in the betting markets here tonight. Okay, let's move on to the last game of the night, Toronto and the Dodgers. Josie Barrios on the mound, 9,200. Now, the ownership's going to keep him in play, but the matchup will not, at least for me. Um, i got pretty serious concerns about playing anybody against the Dodgers, quite frankly. Uh, he's going to induce some ground balls here, but that is not the type of batted ball matchup I want to go after the Dodgers with. I need guys that are honestly fly ball pitchers um, against Dodgers because they got so many fly ball hitters over there. They try to hit the baseball out. 
notably from the left side, like a Max Muncy, um, David Peralta. He's kind of a ground ball hitter, but Jason Hayward, a little bit of a fly ball lean. James Outman, same thing. So they try to hit the baseball in the air. Freddie Freeman is just impossible to go after, as is Mookie Betts. Uh, he's a fly ball hitter. Um, so this is a pretty bad batted ball matchup for Josie Barrios. And at 9,200, I think he's probably a little bit overpriced for this particular spot. The ownership is going to keep him in play on an eight-game slate. Because if you want to get off of Darvish or something, and you still have the 9,400, you know, similar type of construction, you could play a Josie Barrios. Uh, I would not do it with any outsized exposures necessarily. Like 10% would be a total max here just to get some leverage. Um, but do you really want to be trying to get leverage on the field with Jose Barrios against the Dodgers? I mean, it, it seems pretty aggressive, um, at least to me. So not my favorite here. The Arsenal, though, is okay with a break-even change-up. That's really going to be what's going to get him in trouble here tonight. Same thing with the four-seamer. Two-seamer's all right. He's got to stay off of this against these left-handers though, over here uh, and stay really far down in the strike zone and induce a lot of ground balls with the sinker slider. If he could do that, he could survive. Uh, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do this here tonight. I really just don't like going after the Dodgers in general. And I don't think this uh, batted ball profile matchup is all that equitable for, um, for Josie over here. So do I want to play the Dodgers? Yeah, sure. Um, unfortunately, you're not going to get any leverage. The offense is incredibly hot right now. They had a really good series uh, over the weekend, uh, wherever the hell they were. I've forgotten already. Um, but, you know, Mookie and Freddie are still very expensive. Max Muncy hit, you know, seven jacks over the weekend, whatever it is. He's back up to 4,900, unfortunately. Will Smith still expensive at 56, even though the power hasn't really been there this season. So not my favorite getting to them price adjusted, uh, but it's still probably the most potent offense uh, top to bottom on the day today. Eh, it's it's very close with Texas, um, but Texas missing Corey Seager, of course. So I'm probably going to leave most of uh, Josie on the shelf here tonight and probably most of the Dodgers as well. But you got to have exposure in the sort of late night hammer because Josie could very well give up a little bit of pop still to the left side of the plate. Buck 68 ISO. And just a 135 ground ball to fly ball here with a 23% line drive rate. That's Freddie Freeman territory and Max Muncy if he starts seeing the baseball again. So um, you want to play a righty or two? Yeah, sure. That's Mookie with a high fly ball rate himself. He's about an 060, 065 or so. Um, and you can always play him. JD probably going to be out because who the hell knows what happened to him. Um, I believe it was a hamstring or something. So probably going to stay off of the Dodgers for the most part outside of, you know, short exposures where it's just warranted because they're the Dodgers. Michael Grove on the mound for them going after Toronto. Uh, no, thanks. He is a bullpen arm with a bullpen arsenal, bad four seamer, break even slider, and he doesn't have any swing and miss pitch against the opposite side of the plate. Doesn't have a change up, doesn't have a curveball. Uh, and he throws a little bit of a cutter here, which can induce some ground balls and some soft contact to the left side of the plate. But he doesn't throw it enough, and he's still giving up a 324 batting average, a 411 Woba, and a 225 ISO to the lefties. 36, 37 percent hard contact. I don't think we could deal with this, certainly with any of the lefties from the Blue Jays. Uh, that's Brandon Belt territory. He's still he's still 3100. You can play Dalton Varsho, Kevin Kiermeyer, or like a Kevin Biggio. Hopefully, Biggio would be in the lineup tonight, and it won't be Whit Merrifield. Um, so that would make it even less likely that I get anywhere near Michael Grove. Um, not that I was going to do it to begin with anyway, because he's bad against the right side too. 275 batting average, 332 Woba with a 202 ISO. He's got a little bit more swing and miss there, and that's because of the slider, but it's a break-even slider. And he is throwing. Um, I do have a little bit of you know missing data here. It is, I believe, the uh, the sweeper. Um, Fangraphs categorizing it a little bit different here for Michael Grove. That's where the swing and miss is coming from, you know, to the right side of the plate. But he's still giving a power and a neutral ground ball to fly ball ratio there to the righties with a 1.7 homers per nine. So this is a super dangerous spot here for him. Uh, we want to be careful when we eat a lot of ownership on the Jays. Just because they're overall, you know, kind of, uh, they, they can disappoint here or there, right? 109 WRC, but the numbers are good, right? Buck 13 W, um, ground ball to fly ball ratio, I should say, with a 109 WRC plus. 21.5% K rate, that's fine. 260 batting average, that's good. It's the power 
where we want to be a little bit careful. It's just a 165 ISO despite 35% hard contact or 34. Um, so that's how they can disappoint a little bit at high ownership. So we want to be careful with that. And if you want to play DJs, yeah, go ahead. I got no problem with this. And I like Toronto, of course. Um, but as we've talked about, I like a good few other offenses as well who are just as expensive, notably Arizona and Cincinnati and Texas. Um, that have just as much, if not more, upside in their particular matchup. So uh, I've got no problem playing Toronto, but should they really be, from a fundamental perspective, the most popular team of the day when they're actually a dog in the game? Um, you know, you're getting even money on them in the betting markets right now. I think that kind of makes sense a little bit. So I don't want to get too wild with the Jays' ownership necessarily. Even though I really do like them, of course, Vladdy at 5000 that's kind of a steal price, um, given the contact rates of of his. Uh, Springer up top at 49 not great at that price tag necessarily, but it's still okay. 51 for Bo Bichette, that's pretty good. Uh, talked about Brandon Belt, any of the lefties. Matt Chapman, 48 you could play him as well, because he's going to be able to get to baseball in the air here tonight. So I got no problem playing Toronto, it's just ownership that we're going to have to balance there. So mostly uh, offense here tonight, maybe, maybe, maybe some deep tournament Josie Barrios pieces for me, but I doubt it. I hate going after the Dodgers. It'd really be only be a pivot if necessary if I'm playing correlated teams with Toronto, for example, and I need to get different, um, getting off of Darvish or something like that, but very little exposure for me, I think. And some of the Dodgers, yeah, you can go after Josie for sure. Uh, but no Michael Grove whatsoever, and as much Toronto as we can get, given ownership concerns. Okay, that's it for the breakdown. Let's kind of uh, go over a quick review and get out of here. Colorado and Washington, I think Colorado's got to be in play here. They're a very contrarian stack, um, middling in value, and but totally off the board in ownership here tonight. I think they're very much playable. Jake Bird is not. Carl Kaufman is not playable for me, because Washington's still a difficult strikeout matchup, even though they're a pretty bad team. Um the pitchers here, like Jake Bird's just not going to go deep enough. And Carl Kaufman, he might only get three, four innings himself. Uh, and he's not much of a strikeout guy either. So um, mostly the Rockies here for me. You could play some Washington five stacks or even short stacks, sure. But Jay, they're going to lose a lot of the value from their first A-B here uh, attacking Jake Bird if it is him that opens for the Rockies because his ground ball rate is so, so high. So I want to be careful with a lot of the Washington pieces over here. Kansas City, Cleveland, uh, Ryan Yarbrough, eh, 5,800. If you get to him, I don't think it's horrible because he's pretty good against righties. Um, he's still not going to strike anybody out. And, well, he's 5,800. So, yeah, if you need to get to two expensive offenses or something, you can play some Yarbrough uh, and another you know, cheap arm like a, I don't know, a Kenta Maeda or even a Graham Ashcraft or something like that. That's a super contrarian con construction, and R Yarbrough could make that work, but I'm not going to go out of my way to do this because I generally don't go out of my way to play pitchers against Cleveland. Logan Allen I'm going to play a good bit of here tonight, though. Um, I like the swing and miss that he's going to bring to the table against Kansas City tonight. Uh, even though they're going to have probably five righties in the lineup, he's still got good stuff and a good cutter. Uh, against the right side of the plate to keep them off the board. So I like Yogan, uh, Yogan, uh, Logan Allen. A little bit of Yarbrough, maybe. And um, a couple of Cleveland pieces, sure, because you know, Yarbrough is still going to give up a lot of contact. Seattle and Minnesota, Luis Castillo and Kitamaeda mostly. But leverage stacks uh, against these guys are very much in play because they... They have weaknesses, uh, certainly. Kenta Maeda, hard contact to the right side. And Luis Castillo, um, homers and a bad changeup against the left side. So, yeah, sure. But healthy exposures uh, to both of these guys, definitely, because they're two of the better and higher upside pitchers on the day. Texas and Houston, John Gray, maybe a little bit of him. Um, we got to be careful, though. If Jordan Alvarez is back tonight then that's probably going to take me off him and, and shove it more into deep tournament constructions for me with John Gray. But all of the Texas in the world, I want nothing to do with Brandon Belock. Uh, I think he's into, he's due to get uh, blasted and take it apart here tonight. So I'm going to get to as much Texas as I can. Um, and if Jordan is back, you play some, always play him. Uh, you can play Kyle Tucker, of course. And you, that does put a couple of short Houston sacks in play against some John Gray. Because when he's bad, he's really bad. And 8700 is still an expensive price tag for him. Cincinnati and Milwaukee really like the Reds here tonight, as a matter of fact. Um, 
And I like a little bit of Graham Ashcraft. I think he's going to be able to play here against a bad offense. Colin Ray on the other side, he's cheap enough to be in play, but I don't want to go after Cincinnati. Uh, so I'm going to leave that on the table. Maybe a piece here or there for Milwaukee, but probably right off for the most part for me. Uh, I'm just going to go elsewhere and try and get to a good bit of Cincinnati. I, I like the offense a hell of a lot more. St. Louis and Arizona, um, offense only for me here tonight. Too much contact in this game. This is probably your best target for a raw game stack because you're unlikely to be able to make a Toronto Dodgers game stack happen. Uh, this is the one here with St. Louis and Arizona. So uh, no thank you, and offense only. Everybody that you can play if you could make it happen. Pittsburgh, San Diego, I'm leaving Quinn Priester on the shelf because he's just a sinker baller, sinker baller without a strikeout pitch. And against San Diego, you kind of need a strikeout pitch. So um, I like full stacks of San Diego, and if we can make that happen with Darvish in correlated teams, I mean, you're probably not fooling anybody, but uh, I think it's very much in play here. Here in the, um, you know, on the late slate. Uh, well, it's obviously, they play in the main slate, too. But uh, they'll be pretty popular on the late slate, which is this three-gamer. Um, so you might have to figure out how to get different. Um, and you might have to play Jose Barrios or something um, in Toronto in, in the Dodgers. But, uh, you know, all of these offenses really in play down here. Pittsburgh, mostly because of leverage against Darvish, uh, who do, does still give up a little bit of pop uh, to the right side in particular. Um, and you can play Jack Swinski because he's a pretty good hitter against righties. Uh, and in the last game, Toronto and the Dodgers, mostly just offense. Uh, maybe some barriers on the on the late slate or deep tournament stuff. No Michael Grove for me. Um, he just he's very likely to struggle a good bit here. And the Dodgers bullpen's been very attackable really all season. Okay, so that's it. We're done here. Um, projections and ownership updates. Keep an eye out for those as usual. And good luck to everybody here on Monday's Eight Gamer.